Hello everyone. So in today's lecture, I am going to tell you about PNF. So it was so demanding topic. I received so many comments asking me to upload video on PNF. So that's why I chose this topic today. So first, I will cover introduction of PNF. Then I will tell you the procedure of PNF and then the benefits of PNF. And in last, I will cover the diagonal patterns of upper limb and lower limb. So now let's start this video. So PNF is basically made from three words: proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. So in this, the meaning of proprioception means when we are doing any diagonal movement like D1 extension or D1 flexion, it what it actually does is it activates our proprioceptive receptors. Proprioceptive receptors are like joint receptors or muscle spindle, Golgi tendon organs. So when we are performing diagonal movements, it activates our proprioceptive receptors. Now neuromuscular. Neuromuscular means it has something to do with our nerves and muscles. And then facilitation. Facilitation means to make something easy. So let me tell you all this as a whole. So when we are doing diagonal movements or we are using any technique like hold relax or contract relax in PNF, it activates our sensory receptors. Sensory re receptors are basically proprioceptive receptors which are muscle spindle, GTO or joint receptors. So it activates our sensory receptors and sensory receptors send this information to our brain and brain in turn send this information to our muscles to make, to do some movements. So it actually facilitating our movement. It makes our movement more easy. So PNF actually activates our sensory receptors and in turn it is it makes our movement easy. So now there are some other things that you must know about PNF. So first is it focuses on PNF focuses on total human being. So when we are doing D1 extension and D1 flexion, it not just focus on a specific joint, but it actually focus or strengthen or stretch our whole upper limb and even our trunk and head. So PNF does not focus on specific joints such as wrist joint or elbow joint. So it does not focus on a specific problem or a specific joint, but it focuses on total human being. So next is positive approach. PNF treatment is always a positive approach. That means we are only performing movements in a pain-free range. Like for example, if patient can perform only up to here, then this is the pain-free range of the patient, then we have to only perform up to this much range. The PNF should always be positive approach. It should be in pain-free range. We should avoid movements in a painful, painful area. And we should always give achievable task to the patient because when he will achieve the task, it will also motivate the patient. So the task should be always achievable. Next is the aim of PNF is to achieve highest level of function. Through PNF, we want patient to achieve its highest level of function. So this is the main aim of PNF. So now I will tell you the procedure of PNF. So this is very important and I want you all to listen to it carefully. So first is manual contact. So manual contact stimulates the skin receptors or tactile receptors of patient. So when therapist is performing manual contact on patient, what it actually doing is it stimulates the skin receptors or tactile receptors of patient. And you already know that when our sensory receptors will get stimulated, it will send information to our brain and brain in turn facilitate that movement. So through manual contact, we are increasing the sensation, skin receptor sensations. And other than this, a proper manual contact will also help the patient to perform movement in proper direction. So manual contact also help patient to perform movement in correct direction. The most important thing in manual contact that you should know is we use lumbrical grip. So this is the lumbrical grip and we use lumbrical grip to perform the PNF pattern. So what is the benefit of lumbrical grip? So when we are using lumbrical grip, it does not 
produce a squeezing sensation because if we will grasp like this it will produce a squeezing painful sensation to the patient and when we are using lumbrical grip like this so it does not produce a squeezing sensation and it does not produce extra stimulus to the patient so we use lumbrical grip both at the proximal and distal level of manual contact now the next is body position and body mechanics of therapist. So the therapist should always be aligned in the line of the diagonal pattern. Like for example, if I am performing D1 flexion, so therapist should always move along with the diagonal pattern. So my body, my shoulders and my pelvis should always move along with the diagonal pattern. So when I am moving along with the diagonal pattern, it, it gives me effective control of that movement. So I should always align myself along with the diagonal pattern. So the therapist should be standing in a wide base of support, either in strike standing or lunge standing, and he should shift his weight. He should shift his body weight along with the diagonal pattern. The important thing that you should know in body position is, when you are giving any resistive force to any diagonal pattern, that resistive force should come from a therapist body, core body, and it should your hands and your upper limbs should be relatively relaxed. So that force, that resistive force should come from your whole body and your hands should be relatively relaxed. Otherwise, you will become easily fatigued. So your hands should be relatively relaxed and that resistive force should come from your body. Now next is verbal command. So through verbal command, therapist can easily make patient understand what movement he has to perform or when that movement has to perform. Yani ki kab movement karna hai aur kya movement karna hai. That thing therapist can make patient understand through verbal command. So the command that patient is giving should be short, clear and concise. Like for example, squeeze my hand or push my hand up. So these are very short and simple. You don't have to add unnecessary words or complicated words. So the command should be short, clear and concise. If therapist wants a strong muscle contraction, then therapist can use a loud voice. Or if therapist wants relaxation or pain relief, then he can use soft volume of his voice. So this is the importance of verbal command and you should always remember all these procedures while performing PNF pattern on patient. So now next is vision. So this is important. So whenever a patient is performing an upper limb or lower limb diagonal movement, then he should always visualize his or her movement. So when he is performing diagonal movement, he should always visualize his movement because what it actually does is when we visualize our movement, our visual receptors get stimulated and it sends information to our brain and that movement information get registered in our CNS. So he should always visualize his movement while performing PNF. And other benefit of vision is when we are visualizing our movement, it also helps the head movement of that patient. Like for example, if I am doing D1 flexion, then my head movement is also occurring. Like you can see. So you can see my head movement are also occurring while I am visualizing my movement. So it also helps the patient to perform head movements. Now next is resistance. So we all know that we give resistance to increase the strength of the muscle, to increase the motor control or motor learning or for the relaxation of antagonist muscles by reciprocal inhibition. Like for example, if I am giving resistance to forearm flexors, if I am giving resistance, then my antagonist muscle, that is extensor muscles will get relaxed by reciprocal inhibition. But not everyone know what should be the intensity of resistance while performing PNF pattern on patient. So the resistance that we should give is optimal resistance. So it means the resistance should be according to the condition of the patient and the goal of the patient. 
Like for example, the goal of the patient is to increase the strength of muscles, then we should give very intense resistance. But if the goal of the patient is to increase his functional movements, like from sitting to standing or standing to walking, if he wants to increase his functional activities, then we should not give uh, that much high resistance, which we can give mild to moderate resistance. So the resistance should be always optimal resistance according to the goal and condition of the patient. The one thing that you should remember in resistance is the resistance that we are giving to the patient, it should not cause unnecessary pain or unnecessary fatigue, unnecessary irradiation to the patient. So while telling you about resistance, I want to tell you about a term called irradiation because you will come across with this term while studying PNF. So irradiation means spread of muscle activity to the surrounding muscles. Like for example, I am lifting a very heavy bucket full of water. So when I am lifting a heavy bucket, my these muscles are contracting but the resistance is so high that my trunk muscles, surrounding muscles, trunk muscles, in fact the other hand, opposite hand muscles start contracting. So irradiation means when resistance is very high, then there will be spread of muscle activities to the surrounding muscles. And sometimes we give irradiation to patients also for therapeutic purpose. So next is traction and approximation. So traction we usually give at the starting of any diagonal pattern. So if I want to start D1 flexion, then at the starting of D1 flexion, I will give a traction to the patient. So what it actually does is when we are giving traction, it stimulates our joint receptors. So our joint receptors get stimulated and it helps and facilitate that movement. So that's why we give traction at the starting of any diagonal movement because we want that movement to be facilitated. And whereas approximation is usually given at the end of any diagonal movement. So I will give approximation at the end of any diagonal movement because through approximation it, it helps in joint stability. Approximation helps in joint stability and it also helps in co-contraction of antagonist and agonist muscles. Now last is stretch and timing. So in stretch there are basically of two types, stretch stimulus and stretch reflex. So first I will tell you about stretch stimulus. So stretch stimulus means we should place our limb in elongated or lengthened position before initiating any diagonal movement. So for example, I want to do D1 flexion. So before doing D1 flexion, I will keep my upper limb in the elongated or lengthened position that is in D1 extension. So for doing D1 flexion, I will keep my limb in elongated position in D1 extension. And the important thing in stretch stimulus is we should always add rotational component to that muscle. Because when we add rotational component, it actually elongate that muscle more. So for example, if I want to perform D1 flexion, I will keep my limb in extended, abducted and internally rotated position. So when we put our limb in elongated position, it produces a stretch stimulus and facilitate our movement more easily. Next is stretch reflex. So in stretch reflex, what we do is we produce a quick reflex, a quick stretch before starting any movement. So for example, if I want to perform D1 flexion, so before that when my limb it will be in extended position, I will perform a quick stretch and then I will perform D1 flexion. So when I am performing a quick stretch, it actually activates my muscle spindles and facilitate that movement more. So that's why before beginning of any diagonal movement, we should always give a quick stretch to facilitate that movement. Now, last but not the least is timing. So the timing should be when we are performing diagonal movement, the diagonal movement should be continuous, it should not be jerky and it should be coordinated and smooth. So for example, if I'm performing any movement, it should be continuous. Like it should not be like jerky, like I am stopping somewhere and then I am beginning 
so it should not be jerky and it should be continuous smooth the most important thing is when we are performing any diagonal movement we should always start from proximal to distal like for example if i want to perform d1 flexion first i will clench my hand and then i will supinate my forearm and then i will perform the movement of elbow and then i will perform the movements of the shoulder so now i will tell you the benefits of pnf so pnf helps in initiating any movement it helps in increasing the strength it helps in increasing endurance it helps in increasing coordination it increases range of motion it helps in relaxation in decreasing pain it helps in increasing stability and also helps in motor learning so basically there are different techniques like cool relax contract relax rhythmic initiation that helps in all achieving all these benefits now first i will tell you upper limb diagonal patterns so this is t1 extensions for this the scapula will be posterior depression shoulder will be extended abducted and internally rotated elbow will be extended forearm will be pronated wrist will be in ulnar extension fingers will be extended and ulnar deviated and thumb will be palmar abducted and extended now i will flex my fingers and move it to d one flexion pattern all the movements will be reversed now this is d2 extension pattern of upper limb for this the scapula will be anteriorly depressed shoulder will be extended abducted internally rotated elbow in extended forearm pronated wrist ulnar flexion fingers will be flexed and ulnar deviated thumb will be flexed abducted and opposite position then move it into d2 flexion pattern in this all the movements will get reversed except elbow extension now i will tell you lower limb d1 extension pattern for this the hip will be extended abducted internally rotated as you can see knee will be flexed ankle will be plantar flexed everted toes will be, will be flexed and laterally deviated and by reversing all the movements i will bring my leg to d1 flexion pattern in d2 extension hip will be extended abducted externally rotated knee will be extended ankle will be plantar flexed inversion toes will be flexed and medially deviated extend the toes and bring it to d2 flexion hip will be flexed abducted and internally rotated knee will be flexed and ankle will be dorsiflexed and everted toes will be extended and laterally deviated so yeah it's done so i hope it made sense to you all and if you like my video then don't forget to like share and subscribe to my youtube channel physios healing touch